used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Good morning, friends. It's that time again. Time to bring the word. Who's ready? Yeah. Before I expect to speak for God, I want to speak to him. Lord, thank you for bringing us together today. Let us take advantage, full advantage of this opportunity to hear from you, to hear what you have to say, so that we can take that and bring it out into our lives every day. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen. Um, today we're going to talk about the concept of holy ground. And we're going to talk about what that means and perhaps a little something you might not have thought of before with regard to the Christian life and this whole concept of holy ground. Our lesson is going to be coming from Exodus 3.5. So let's uh, get into the story a little bit of what was going on. Very familiar story. We all know about Moses and the burning bush. We've heard this a million times. We're going to hear it again. <laughs> Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. It's another name for Mount Sinai. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So Moses is having what he feels is probably a pretty typical day. Comes to the mountain with the sheep. He's out doing his things, keeping an eye on the sheep. It's a work day. Some folks have said that perhaps he was going to the mountain of God for a specific purpose, for worship or prayer or whatever, the other way of looking at this is, well, what makes it the mountain of God in the first place, since we don't hear that before this in the Bible? I tend to think it's because it was written about past events. This is going to be what makes it the mountain of God, how I see it anyway. This is something unexpected. This is going to be a big deal, right? We know that this is, this is where Moses' ministry is going to get kicked off with this all-important conversation that he has uh, with the Lord. And he's just going along on a typical day, and suddenly something happens. An absolute miracle of God. Something that can't happen in nature. You can't have something burn like this, flammable material burn, and nothing come of it. So obviously this is one of those times when God literally steps physically into nature and does something to get our attention. He never does these things randomly. There's a purpose behind it. Notice what Moses says. I found this kind of interesting. He says, I will turn aside, keep that phrase in your mind that's going to come up later, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. He's going along on his typical path and says, wow, what's that? You don't see that every day. I'm going to go over there and see what that's about. I want to get closer. And the Lord says, do not come near. Hold it right there, Moses. Don't get any closer. Take your sandals off. A sign of respect now as it was back then. 
Take your sandals off your feet. The place on which you are standing is holy ground. You're not just anywhere. Stop right there. He says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I wonder what the Lord's voice sounded like. Was it a mighty bellow? Or did he just say, Moses? Because the power is in the person, not in the sound, right? I wonder what, what his voice would have sounded like. I'm very curious about that. So the Lord identifies himself. And what happens with Moses? Ah! Moses hit his face. He was afraid to look at God. Didn't mean it. Wasn't really looking. Honestly, didn't see anything. To, you know, it's, it's fine. You know, it's, right? It was fine a minute ago when he said, I want to go over there and check this out and see what's going on. I'm curious about this. This is cool. I'm going right over there. Until he found out who it was. Then everything changed. He didn't know who it was until God chose to reveal himself. Once he found out, everything was different. Why? Because God is awesome. Because God is like nothing or anyone we can even imagine. We throw that word around a lot. I throw that word around a lot. We'll go back for uh, lunchtime uh, uh, later on in the fellowship hall, and, and you know, Andrew will bring one of his salads, and inevitably someone later on will come up and go, Andrew, that salad was awesome. It was really, how did you, what did you put in there? That, that was really awesome, right? Or um, somebody, you know, somebody might go up to uh, Rev on a Sunday and say, boy, that was an awesome sermon. Or you might hear something like, did you see that pass Tom Brady threw on Sunday? That was awesome. Was it really? I don't think so. Now I know what you're thinking. Yeah, I'd like to see you do it, pal. Yeah. <laughs> of course I can't do it. But that concept, we... we, we we, uh, w words tend to lose their meaning for us sometimes, right? When we throw them around so casually. Did you notice what Darlene said about God being like a mighty hurricane and us being like a little, a little tree getting bent over from the sheer force? It's hard to even get our minds around the awesomeness of God. So this idea of holy ground, it was holy ground because that's where God was. That's what made it the mountain of God. Otherwise, it's just a mountain. Let's go to another situation a little later. Talking about Joshua. It says, When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So Joshua challenged him. And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Notice the reaction. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. We see that in Joshua 5. You see the parallel here. This is the other time in the Bible when we hear this bit about taking off your sandals, standing on holy ground. The first time we hear that the angel of the Lord was in the bush, this time we see uh, an encounter with the commander of the Lord's army. What we're talking about in both cases is the theophany. This is an appearance of God to man, a personal appearance. This is distinguished from other such appearances, such as we see in Revelation chapter 19. John meets with the angel and he says, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus worship God. So when you hear, there are many instances of angels in the Bible, but this is a little more specific in these two instances that we looked at. We're not just talking about an angel, we're talking about God himself. The angels themselves, as you can see, would freak out if you try to worship them. Why? They'd be in a lot of trouble if they accept that kind of worship. The only angel who wanted that kind of worship is Satan. So this whole idea about taking off your sandals, there's kind of a lot to it, actually, in, in ancient history, and I don't want to spend too much time on that, but there was, you know, it involved like a business transactions and everything else, but, but the most important thing is it kind of disconnects you from the, from the land around you, you're not carrying anything untoward or undesirable along on your feet, and your, your feet are in direct contact. So as 
it, we think about it now, especially like so there are places where you want to walk into, like say uh, the Muslim faith, where you walk into one of their houses of worship, you better take your shoes off. That's a big deal. So that, that sign of uh, respect still carries through even today. And there's another place where we see this. In Isaiah 20, 3 and 4, it says, Then the Lord said, As my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot for three years as a sign and a portent against Egypt and Cush, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian captives and the Cushite exiles, both the young and the old, naked and barefoot. So here's this idea of not having anything on your feet again. But more than that, this takes it a step farther. You don't even have any clothes on. This is a state of reproach. This is a state of poverty. This is saying you have absolutely nothing left. You've got nothing to offer. This is it. This is me and I got nothing. I can't do anything for you. I can't offer you anything. I'm, I'm just... I'm just out of gas. I've got nothing for you. When we approach God in any way, we are stepping onto holy ground. And we should do that naked and barefoot, spiritually speaking. What do we have to offer God that he actually needs? Nothing. It's amazing that his attitude toward us is what it is, that he cares so much for us. How many times in our lives do we realize that we do exactly the opposite of what he wants us to do? How frequently? And how, and how frequently is that love and that mercy shown to us again and again and again and again? So, so when I saw that idea about naked and barefoot, I'm like, that's pretty much how we need to refer. We don't... There's no, there should be no pride at all in our manner of approach to God. We should be basically thinking of ourselves as naked and barefoot. So when we approach God, most importantly, we want to approach him in faith. The Lord tells us right in here, right in the Bible, tells us who he is, tells us all about himself, tells us what he wants from us, tells us how we're supposed to live. The question is, do we believe what it says in here? Do we actually believe that everything in here is true? It's got to start there. How can we live the Christian life if we don't have that belief in what God says? If we believe what he says, then we should trust him. In all these things that we don't understand, all these things that just don't, don't seem to jibe with, with the typical human existence, all these things that we worry about, all these things that come against us, if we believe he's who he says he is and he can do what he says he can do and that he'll always be there for us and care for us, then we should be able to trust in exactly that. As I said, naked and barefoot, the amount of, what, what is the, the proper amount of reverence toward God? All I can say is total. Every, every bit of reverence we have to offer, he deserves that and more. We have to really just put it all out there, put ourselves out there for the Lord and just say, look, I want you to have every bit of me and I don't want to hold anything back. And repentance. I got to tell you, I'd have a tough time coming up with a day when I couldn't think of something I need to apologize to the Lord for, one way or another. That's not a bad thing. The Christian life is largely one of repentance because we're aware, we know the difference, we know what other folks don't about what pleases God and what doesn't please God. And so we get sensitive to that, right? As The deeper you go into the Christian life, the more sensitive you get to that and you realize you've offended God in ways you didn't even think about in the past. So although that can be a little depressing at times, there's to, that awareness is an important thing to know, to know that and to be able to go to God and make it right. Gratitude. Everything. Everything, let me say it again, everything we have, everything we know, everything we can do, every breath we take, absolutely everything that we're capable of doing, any progress we're going to make, anything we think we're going to get out of this life comes from God. And we must never forget that even for a second. It's got nothing to do with us. It's what he does or anything we're unable to do, we can't do without him. 
And one of the keys to this is to never forget that and always to be grateful for what God has done for us and what he continues to do for us. No matter how much we goof things up, he is always there. It's astounding, isn't it? So when you look at all that, how can you approach God any other way except with an attitude of humility? Naked and barefoot. I want to show you something. Have a look at the following image. Images. Now I think this is a good visual representation of the approach to God. Now is this a, any kind of a, you know, am I trying to tell you that this is how you need to, no. But I mean spiritually speaking though, this is what your attitude should look like. I've got nothing to offer that I can see, but whatever I have is yours, Lord. I'm all yours. Now look at this. This would be a Catholic priest's ordination ceremony. He's literally face down. And this one. Right? We hear in the Bible again and again, we talk about falling on your face, right? Is a nun taking her final vows. Not ashamed of the gospel, not worried about the fact that she's got an audience behind her. Not worried about looking silly. Just proned out before God. I don't know if any of you have tried this. I found it to be a little bit of an eye-opening experience when I did. It certainly gives you perspective, and I would highly recommend it. Give it a whirl. You'd be surprised. That whole attitude, the little sapling being overwhelmed by a hurricane, a whole different approach to prayer. One of my favorite preachers, Dr. Michael Youssef, said, prayer isn't submitting your wish list to God. Prayer is reporting for duty. I don't know how to say it any better than that. Let's get back to that idea of turning aside. Moses is going along on his path, and suddenly, oh, what's that? Something gets his attention. As we go along in life, before we know the Lord, suddenly... There he is. And we turn aside from the wrong path, from the wide path, onto the little path that we almost missed, but then it got our attention, and we turned aside from death to life when we turned to God. The Christian life should involve a lot of turning aside, quite frankly, from the path that we're tempted to follow, turning aside from our own pride, and thinking we're all that, when basically we're just the opposite of all that. Turning aside from selfishness, not living for ourselves any longer. Turning our gaze outward. Turning aside from everything that the world wants to show us. The world's got plenty of things to show us. In a wide variety of, of formats, analog, digital, you, know, you, got, you name it, the, the world's got it for you. Turning aside from unforgiveness. What's our typical response that we see in the world it's more like revenge than forgiveness, right? You want to strike back. Jesus says, that's the wrong path. You turn away from that. What do we turn to? We turn to humility. We start to realize who we really are and who God really is. And it's a very humbling experience, quite frankly. We now turn away from that self-focus to a focus of worship. Looking up to God. We turn to a life that pursues holiness. We turn to a life of servitude to God. We are here to serve him. He is certainly not here to serve us. We are not here for ourselves. We're here for God. Thinking more about this um, idea of, of holy ground, very often, you know, that's easy to define what folks consider holy ground, things like, like, like a cemetery. Regardless of uh, faith or the lack thereof, people will tend to agree on that. They say that's a good example of, of holy ground. So holy ground is a place. It's holy ground because people are buried there. Church buildings of various types, people will see that. Even people who don't really understand the idea all that well, you talk about a church as holy ground, they go, okay, yeah, we, we get that. Places such as over in India, the Ganges River, and that's highly regarded as sacred. In spite of all the animals traipsing through there, doing their business and everything else, people will go in there and they want to wash in it because that's considered a sacred place. That's considered holy ground. But you know, 
a church building, no matter how fancy it is, no matter how many big name preachers have spoken there, no matter how much money they have, no matter how big a congregation they have, a church is a building. And it remains nothing more than a building until the body of Christ walks in. That's what makes the difference. It's not the church. This is not the brick church because it has a sign outside that says a brick church. It's the brick church because we're in here. The church in Uganda, Pastor Hillary's church, it's a building until they walk in and then something happens. Why? Because they take holy ground with them. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is pointing out the problem with sexual sin in particular and how it's sinning against your own body is really a significant thing because he says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? So I submit to you that as indwelled believers in the Lord Jesus carrying the Holy Spirit with us, we take holy ground with us. We bring it. When we say God is present here, do you know why he's present here? Because he came in with you when you walked in taking that concept a little bit farther. Could believers showing the love of Christ in a soup kitchen be standing on holy ground when they do that? Is God's love present there? Sure it is. What about that friend who's at the end of their rope and they need you to talk to them? And that time you spend with them, is that not sacred time? Did you not bring holy ground to that conversation? What about a group of believers gathered around the table Studying the word of God, trying to learn more about him, could that not be considered holy ground? It's just a building until they walk in. This idea of holiness, the Lord says, be holy as I am holy. The way the English standard translates this is my favorite because it says, be holy as I am holy. It doesn't say, be as holy as I am. We know that ain't happening but be holy in the way that I am holy. Emulate what I do. Be like me. Try to be like me as best as you can because holy is as holy does. So when we talk about holy behavior, we say, okay, we're, what's, what's the outline for that? Oh, it's in here. Look up anything to do with the Lord Jesus. Would you like it? like to know how to live a holy life. It's right in here. All the instruction, all the examples that he gave in his life, all the things he taught, all the things he said, the way he dealt with people. If you want to know about holy living, it's all right there. So a few things to remember. We always want to be aware of God's presence. If you're walking around indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, as far as I'm concerned, you're always standing on holy ground. And we need to behave accordingly. We always need to wear our glasses of faith. We need to look at our lives through those lenses. Everything, not just when we're here, everywhere we go and in everything we do. We want to think of that concept of always standing on holy ground. I want to read something to you. In Genesis 28, the story about Jacob's ladder. I'm very familiar with that. At the end, after his dream, it says, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. We must always be aware of God's presence. Always know that, spiritually speaking, we're always standing on holy ground.